You're listening to Changing Reality. Changing Reality, where we bend reality all across the world. Only on WQHS Radio. So welcome everyone to another episode of Changing Reality. Uh, I'm your host Harsha and you're watching us from WQHS Radio. So we're so excited to have you guys here with us on this Thursday evening. If you guys are tuning in from the uh, University of Pennsylvania, from Philadelphia, or from wherever you are around the world. So once again, the show is called Changing Reality. If this is your first time on the show, welcome one, welcome all. Changing Reality is a show that features phenomenal people from all walks of life who are, in essence, as the show gives away, changing their own reality. And through the show, we'll have the opportunity to hang out and interview so many phenomenal people from social change makers, industry leaders, uh, pioneers of various fields, entrepreneurs, business owners, to even artists, musicians, and inspiring individuals from all across the world, so that we can hopefully hear their inspiring stories on how they're changing the world around them through their own experiences and the journeys that have brought them to where they are today. And hopefully from listening to these stories and experiences, we can take away a little bit of wisdom or nuggets that we can apply in our own life to live the lives that we are passionate about. And I'm someone who wanted to do the show simply because I feel like there are a lot of people out there who do phenomenal, brilliant things and make waves of the lives of those around them. And I'm really passionate about learning how they're doing that and being able to find out what their experiences are beyond what we read about or what we hear on the surface and really seeing what made them to be the people that they are. And hopefully by listening to these stories, we can get a little bit insight on what we need to do to get there one day in our own personal capacities. And just to show you how passionate I am about the power of stories and how much I believe in it, Personally, I actually founded and run a youth movement called Ascendance, uh, back from where I was from in Malaysia, which today collaborates with uh, not only 28 different countries, but over 900 communities, including uh, ministries of education, uh, uh, large MNCs, global leaders, to help provide an alternative education platform for any student out there who wants to change their reality. So we work with students from elementary all the way up to college um, through various experiential learning sessions, programs, activities, projects that they actually go and get hands-on involved and do all of this in a way to help them discover their passion, learn about the world around them, but also themselves. And through these real world experiences, get the things that they need to start their own careers while they're still in school, which creates meaningful impact, not just for them, but for those around them as well. And we've been fortunate over the last um, seven years that we've been around to actually uh, work with over 35,000 students in these 28 countries, 970 communities, and have incubated over, um, I think, countless number of student-run projects and social enterprises run by students aged 8 to 25 years old themselves. And the basis of all of this, the reason we were able to run it and make so much of impact was because of stories, because of so many kind individuals who actually take the effort to share what they've gone through, their experiences, and shorten the learning curves of the people that we've been fortunate to meet through Ascendance. And just like that, I hope that this show serves as a similar platform for you to have those experiences as well, so that you can have a career that's meaningful, so that you can get a little glimpse into how the real world works. And if you have any questions about it, if there's any particular topics you want to talk about, if there's any themes that you're interested in, do let us know in the chat below. Uh, we'll read the comments. We'll see what we can do. And hopefully, uh, we'll be able to cater the show to the things that you need to learn to live the life that you want. And speaking about living a life that you want, uh, I think that we're living in unprecedented times where technology is making leaps and bounds. And therefore, it's only fair that we interview one of the main people out there who is actually in the center of uh, where this, where the latest tech and innovations are leading. So today we have a transformational leader and innovation executive who's at the forefront of strategy, technology, and creativity. She brings with her over 20 years of experiences working globally in digital marketing and experience strategy for leading consumer brands. And she has proven strength in leading multidisciplinary teams and pioneering innovative experiences, new business models, and products and services, all the way from Web 1.0 to the metaverse, where we are right now. So currently, our speaker is none other than the Managing Director of Strategy and Innovation at Accenture Interactive, 
where in her current role, she focuses on the strategic design and application of immersive technologies for businesses and brand transformation. And prior to that, she was also the head of global digital strategy um, and EVP at Havas Media Group, where she led and managed strategic planning worldwide with a focus on digitally integrating marketing communications and innovation. And prior to that, held so many other high position roles in the various fields. Uh, she's an active participant in the XR community, speaking regularly at industry conferences and events, and a contributing writer for various leading publications. So without further ado, let's welcome our very accomplished, amazing speaker for today to our virtual switch. Let's welcome Roy. Hi. Hello. Thanks for that a very nice introduction. Good to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. As I said, it's an honor to have you and you've accomplished so much and it's such, I would say, a leader in kind of like the fields that you're in. So I was just so excited to be able to hear your experiences and see um, how it all got started. Sure, yeah. yeah. And hopefully today's been a good day and we haven't caught you too badly off time. Um, I think it's a bit of a public holiday, so apologies for setting it um, on an awkward day. No, no worries. I'm just happy that I'm healthy. I think everybody's in between getting sick right now or healthy or sick. So glad it's a day that you're healthy and I'm healthy. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah. And I feel like with the fear of COVID, I think everyone like like every time I get a regular fever, that that fear is, is more than the actual sickness that I actually face. So definitely a good day for mental and physical health, and hopefully the same for you as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're someone who, um, I one thing that I didn't mention in your introduction is you were also a Penn alum, so you were um, a bachelor student at the University of Pennsylvania, but you started off doing something that is a little bit, I would say, completely different than what you do now. So you were actually in the arts and political sciences when you were here at Penn. And I personally know that right now, a lot of people are saying, we've got to learn about tech, we've got to learn about strategy, we've got to learn about all of this. Um, but normally I don't hear this from arts and political science majors. So were you someone who knew like this is the like direction you needed to go in? Like this is where the future is headed when you were a lost college student like us? Or like what did you really think you were going to do going into Penn when you started out? Well, you know, this really dates me. But when I started, when the, the internet really didn't exist much. And... Uh, you know, I came from when I was in high school, I was painting, I was an artist, um, but, you know, wanted to go to a school that wasn't just art and wound up, at, you know, at the University of Pennsylvania and was exploring different majors. I was, I was lucky to be able to do an individualized major then um, with art and, and political science. And originally I had thought about art and business, but what, what I was really looking for was, you know, how at that point, if I think back, how people were trying to change the worlds around them. And at that point, art was, was the primary mechanism, whether it was visual arts or, or music and, and politics, right? Um, we didn't have the internet. When I discovered the internet, you know, while I was at Penn, we started to get email. And um, when I graduated, as an artist, I thought, wow, this medium, digital, is the next big medium that's gonna enable me to be creative and explore. I didn't know how at that point, I just knew that it had the potential. And if you fast forward even you know, 20 years now, if you speak to a lot of people who are excited about this, you know, jump today, virtual reality, metaverse world, it's people who are creative because they think, oh my goodness, I can change you know, the reality of the world around me um, and, and, and create new environments and experiences. So. Strangely, they're linked. Um, I think it's the, the creative mindset. It's the mindset um, that you, you're trying to see what's around you and where you can make things better or different. So at, when I was at Penn, like I said, we there wasn't really any much digital media. There was a, not even much art. We had a, the art house was, I, for people who remember, I mean, probably not people listening here, was this blue house, um, blue building like on the field um way i forget the god in the, the the edge of the campus um it's i've heard it's much better now <laughs> all right so to all the artists at penn be grateful like like she's the one who like like kicks like started all the stuff like that we enjoy so thank you to all the art majors out there who like flourished at penn and made them realize that okay there's something here but you mentioned something that i really loved which is kind of like 
seeing how art could change the world and then linking that up with kind of like the, the knowledge from political science. And those are, and, and I don't, and may not be a hot take, but like, I personally feel that art is very, very relevant in kind of like political science and where things are moving and kind of like changing reality. I mean, quote the show title. But this is something that um, I think is something that I've learned after uh, many conversations and many like like the time spent with artists who are very passionate about using their mediums to change the world. I mean, my sister's a musician and her tagline is changing the world with music. So she, I've always been fortunate to be surrounded with those kind of people. And I, and I sometimes still encounter those people who don't necessarily view it like that. How do you go about as a college student kind of like navigating what and figuring out what interests you and coming to kind of like this intersection? I mean, you know, excuse me, when I was at Penn, like I said, there wasn't really um, much of an art community. We created the first artist guild and we used to do, you know, these crazy things where we would plaster, um, like in the middle of the night, go out and put like sheets all over Locust Walk and say like, you know, this is art, you're walking on art. So that when people woke up, they were like literally walking on art. We would do a lot of, um, you know, public activations of art um, and the environment um, because I think it's, you know, out of sight, out of mind. If you don't see it, you don't think about it. So, so much of, of what at that point we were trying to do was just make, you know, shake up the tree, make people on the university aware that there was, you know, this, this, the, these individuals, groups of people like myself who were passionate about something beyond, let's say, you know, um, economics and um, literature. And, and, you know, now I think the world is so different. I think that the, the pen community is so much more active and vibrant and in a way that we weren't back then. But I remember feeling like, you know, I was uh, a small little, we, were, we represented this minority. And I think that's something you know, wherever I've gone, it's always, I always want to bring forth like the, the alternative um, perspective and, and, you know, make large of it. I don't know if you still have this individualized major program at Penn. Do you know if that still exists? I, I do an individualized major with um, like, but I also do a working adults kind of program. So, but my also individualized major. So I do positive psych organizational culture and a third one on digital culture. So at least I, I, I would agree that it still exists. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, for me, it was phenomenal because, you you know, you got to sort of craft um, studies around wh wh where you were most interested. So, um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And you you went on to kind of like dabble in the art space. I think you one of the first few uh, kind of like companies you worked at was actually called the Art Directors Club, which I think can't get more specific artists literally in the name of it. And um, you and how was the experience kind of like stepping out into kind of like the industry and actually having a job and a role um, among the art world in a way? Like, was it something yeah. like all your expectations came true and was like, yes, this is exactly what I thought it'd be? Or was it a little different? Well, when I was I, when I was at um, UPenn, I remember I worked at the Institute of Contemporary Art and I, I loved the environment. I always felt like electrified being around contemporary art and my plan, like I'm sure many Penn students, was to move to New York and get a job. And, you know, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And I would say that nobody should feel worried if they're in that position right now, because you have a long road ahead and you might as well be as adventurous as possible. <laughs> I don't think anyone regrets that. But anyhow, I was looking in the city for a job in an art gallery. And most of the jobs I was looking at were willing to hire me, you know, to answer phones and be a receptionist. And I sort of wanted something more than that. Uh, and I came across this place called the Art Directors Club. And it actually wasn't a gallery in the sense that I thought, you know, it wasn't for, for visual artists. It was a commercial art space. So people working in advertising and entertainment and media. So art directors, graphic designers, they um, their work was was on display there, and I got a job helping basically um, do marketing, develop new um, new business sponsors for for their award show that they would do every year. This is in 1996, 
So the internet was taking off and there was also new media, which is what we called it back then, was starting to happen. And so, you know, we'd have these amazing exhibitions with like MTV or, you know, um, I don't know, new Nickelodeon or new companies that were trying to create interactive experiences, new artists. Um, so it was, it was my first exposure to advertising, a world where people could make money around art and creativity that wasn't just, you know, um, as direct as being a visual artist. So that was, that was really exciting and interesting. No, absolutely brilliant. I think like when we spoke previously, you mentioned that you originally wanted to major in art and business, but that was not something that they, they kind of like offered as a pairing. And, but like, I mean, in hindsight, art business is like a huge thing now. So. Wharton told me no at that time. I mean, I'm literally no. my first to no. Wharton. I mean, I have such a like love hate relationship with business because, you know, when I was at university of Pennsylvania, I was pretty anti the idea of business school. Although I guess if I think about it, it's it's a bit of a hypocrisy because I did go to Wharton and try to do a double major, you know, a, a major that was about art and business, and then I wound up going to business school four years after I graduated. So, um, you know, it's it's uh, and I think now more than ever, I, there's a lot, you know, there is the business of art, like you know, you see that now, yeah. and it's really hard to to separate the two worlds. So. And it is really hard to separate the two worlds. And I feel like like when, when you put them together, you have a career that kind of like meanders between the two. But there's also many people who I feel struggle, who are extremely artistic and they kind of like struggle with kind of like understanding where their artistic abilities can be best applied in the business world. So maybe they're, they're not so sure like if they can work in advertising or if they can work in like many of these different options that are available for them. Or even if they do, it's kind of like that creative side of them doesn't kind of like meet the business and the more regulatory side of it. You're someone who seems very balanced in your right brain, left brain. Was this something like that you learned along the way or has it always just come naturally to you to kind of like see both sides of it? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I wouldn't definitely say I'm not, not the, there's a lot of people like, like me, left brain, right brain. I think when your parents um, are both lawyers and you grow up, wanting to be an artist, you kind of like, somehow you learn to, to, to balance both sides, both sides of the world. So um, yeah, I've kind of straddled back and forth, back and forth. It's, you know, how do I fit in uh, fulfilling my creative desires? I, I made a decision, you know, at one point I had friends who were artists and this is once again in the 90s, you know, a lot of them want to become HTML designers or, you know, and become designers in the web. And at that point, I, I wasn't ready. Um, you know, there's a certain um, mentality and personality that's willing to just like be an artist full time, get paid. You know, you're opening yourself up to, to critique by clients. And I guess I, I always wanted to keep that side safe. And the business side was easier to expose, you know, to, 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 to the rest of the world and interact and not, I wasn't as vulnerable as I might've felt as an artist because art to me is incredibly personal. And so th that's probably why I've kind of jumped back and forth between the two. Okay. Amazing. And you did kind of like, I think, go to the business side of art in your next jump when you went to, I think you became an art buyer at um, FCB yeah. Global, yeah. which is a, a, a pretty cool job. And I think that that's something that most people um, dream about having kind of like that job was it all like what were your expectations kind of like going into it and what was something about the job that was unexpected to you as um someone who was so who probably at that point of time thought that okay this is something that you want to try out that was new and so i you know the art directors club was a great job i had a lot of fun i learned a lot um I took this job as an art buyer because one of my clients said to me, you know, you're really good at negotiating and you like art. So be an art buyer. And I didn't really know what an art buyer was, but it sounded pretty glamorous and cool that I would get, you know, work with artists and uh, get to review their work. Um, and that was the first time. And there'll be many times after where I realized in life that a job that sounds cool is often not a job that you want. If you, you know, there's so many jobs, in like luxury and media, the coolest jobs, the coolest brands, oftentimes those jobs are really painful because you wind up doing, um, you know, work that is 
uh, you know, the, the real rigor, the real harder work often ha tends to happen in jobs people don't hear about, you know? Um, and so being an art buyer, it wasn't incredibly challenging uh, for, for me. It was interesting, you know, uh, I think I mentioned to you at one point, it was the time when, you know, people would bring over these big portfolios of artwork. So like an art, you know, we would decide who would work best in this chase campaign or who would work best in the, you know, these different um brand campaigns and i remember thinking like wow a lot of stuff going back and forth and messengers and you know that was stock photography was starting to happen then so I, I were trying to set up a stock photography system like online and i would you know email art directors photos and be like maybe you can choose from this library of photos here that was you know as uh as exciting for me as that job got I, i'm sure there are other people who you know are phenomenal at it i just remember thinking this is not living up to what i thought an art buyer you know would feel like and so while i was there i actually started to look into developing my own company on the side to sort of stimulate myself you know brain and in other ways yeah then being an entrepreneur is something that is not easy and like it's takes a lot of extreme work and all of that how did you kind of like like start off in like your own like side hustle if i may use the term and like start like uh finding clients and positioning yourself as someone who like would have like a little business by themselves and what well, what do you think was your biggest difference that you kind of learned about being like like working with somewhere and having your own thing yeah you know i remember after graduating penn the first like five years, maybe even longer, I used to go to bed every night and like think about new business ideas. Every day I would be like, what new business idea can I come up with? It was just like constantly trying to come up with new ideas, new ideas, new ideas. So a lot of the, um, the desire to start something new was, like I said, it's always just to find something new, to introduce something new. And so the the company that I started at the point was called Future Flare. It was with a, a French woman um, I had met at the Art Directors Club when I was leaving. She was just joining, and we both were passionate about art. She had a, a focus more on architecture and design and furniture, and you know I was coming more from the visual arts. And we put together this company, and we were like working with different really well known now you know, uh, graphic designers and artists that were working with different um, retail stores in Soho in downtown New York City um, or internationally uh, like Cartel and there was a magazine Avatare and I just remember all these different these brands and we it was really exciting um, but that was when I also discovered you know first time that I'm not a salesperson she wasn't a salesperson neither of us were good at you know, getting business leads. I mean, we had enough of a community that we, it started off that way. You know, we're like, we could do, you know, these different interested things um, and create new experiences and new events. And, um, and the, like I said, the internet was just kind of coming out and there was different ways we thought about using the, the, the digital media. Um, but it, it was, it was a bit of a struggle to, to keep that going. I never turned it into a full-time gig because it was never profitable enough to do that. Um, and as much as I wanted, I, I always feel like it's one thing to be an entrepreneur, have great ideas, but if you're really an entrepreneur, like you, you either yourself or you find somebody who is really good at selling and getting new business um, because that, you know, without a sales leads and opportunities, you know, basically, you know, you're not going, going anywhere too fast. <laughs> No, 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 that's very good. And I think like like the biggest, like the hardest part I do, I feel like as an entrepreneur is sometimes not just, as you mentioned, coming up with ideas, it's just that how do I package this idea and, and sell others on the idea and, and kind of like get the feedback from other idea. And there's a whole other process behind it, which personally I'm not always a fan of. So I'm glad that you brought it up. But no, like it's still very admirable that you actually tried that out and actually like like had that experience and i think that also brings us back to kind of like the point where you go to business school in your journey and are you going to nyu which is absolutely brilliant um but why not decide to kind of like pivot and try something new i mean like we heard the love-hate relationship earlier so what yeah, like, what yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> exactly um 
before I answer that, I just wanted to say one last thing about entrepreneurship, because it's something I've thought about my entire career. And people are always like, why don't you go just do your own thing? Because I always, you know, there's, I think, three elements. There's the idea, there's the execution, and there's, well, the, the sale, right? Getting somebody to buy it. To me, we're at a point in time now where ideas are, you know, like having an idea is so low on this. Like it's the ability to execute and the ability to like make a connection between a buyer and, um, you know, somebody who wants to buy and somebody who's creating, making that connection. So uh, that's kind of at one point I decided my, my drive to keep coming up with ideas all the time. I was like, you know, there's if you, there's an idea that you have, there's a good chance like it's already been thought of. I, um, I, I learned that over time. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep coming up with good ideas. It's just that a lot of people will be like, I have this brilliant idea. I'm going to go start a company. And to me, that's um, 10% of it, right? It's, it's really how are you going to execute it and how are you going to make it you know, last and profitable and you know, however you're going to make money or make it sustain. But anyhow, going back to your question about um, business school. So I left Foot Cohen and Belding after two years there. I had a friend who was working um, at one of the internet companies. There are a lot of internet companies popping up in the late 90s. Um, this company was called Coco Pelli New Media. Uh, and I went over there to help them rebrand to Coco Media because there was a copyright infringement with Coco Pelli or something. And it was, you know, a 50 person shop. We were building websites uh, for, you know, first the first generation websites for a lot of brands. And it was really fun and interesting, and I learned a lot there. But you know, while I was there, in retrospect, it was only four years out of college. At that time, it seemed like a lifetime. It's like, wow, you know, I'm not advancing as fast as I thought. I don't know what unrealistic, crazy expectations I had, where you know, where I would be four years out of college. But um, I thought maybe, you know, maybe I just need to know more, or do more things, and you know, I had, I did have like family pressures like are you going to go back to, to business school what are you going to do and um i thought okay i i really did have a pretty liberal arts background you know i did this individualized major and there's probably a bunch about business or law or some other area of the world that i should know to round myself off and um as I said, my parents were both lawyers and they're like, don't go to law school. They didn't encourage <laughs> <laughs> lawyers. They're the, you know, business, business is what you want to do because that way you can like choose a lot of different careers after that. And so I applied to, to, to NYU. You know, it was, I wasn't sure I was going to go. I was like, well, maybe, you know, I'll be in, in New York City. And then I got accepted. And, you know, right as I got accepted, the dot com bust pretty much happened like a year less than a year later. Um, and so it, it turned out really fortuitous for me that I, I decided to go back to school then. I mean, what I really wanted was to make sure that I could understand what, you know, I was missing in order to sort of like catapult myself forward, right? There was a whole world of business. What are the people, the other people in the, in the, in the meeting, what do they know that I don't know? What do I need to do to move forward? because I didn't feel like I, I had enough knowledge. So I was there for, you know, the two years while the internet, the first generation of the, you know, internet um, bust happened. Um, and so that was, a, that was a pretty interesting time, but I'm really, really glad that I went back to, to school then, I, you know, I met some amazing people and I, and I did learn a lot of the skills that I use today, right. You know, just in terms of negotiation, um, economics, things that I just didn't want to deal with when I was an undergrad. So. No, no, I think that's, that's a very nice perspective. And I think that many of many of times I feel like, um, I, I, first of all, I have to address the point where you say like five, four years out of college and you have unrealistic expectations. Thank you for setting our expectations right for all our college students listening. But I, but I also like that part about kind of like going back when you feel like you need to learn something and, and kind of like trying to figure out what it is that you need to learn to kind of like bring it to the next um, level in a way. And you did your MBA, if I'm not mistaken, um, in marketing and information systems, um, which is very, very cool, uh, but also slightly different from the art side of things that you were working on prior to that. So this kind of like is a bit of a kind of like, I would say a pivot in your career after that, where you started um, going more into kind of like interactive marketing and all of that. How did you kind of like, leaving business school 
um, what was your mindset leaving business school and what do you think like your first role after that um, taught you or built on that experience that you had like did it confirm the things that you were learning in the classroom did it enhance the things that you were learning or was there still a lot more in kind of like the practical application of the stuff that you were learning in this whole marketing arena yeah so you know i majored in marketing and information systems because they didn't, digital wasn't like a thing then you couldn't <laughs> i couldn't imagine that oh gosh like digital or interactive or the, none of the um the words we use now today so that was the closest they had to like the internet was in um you know uh um that was the closest term they had they had and so um and and you know just to to restate like i said when i first discovered this web or internet the artist in myself at that point was like this is justice there was something about it i don't want to be all like weirdly cliche and be like it was like a canvas that you know but it, there was i always knew that there was something in that space it was fascinating to me it was like endless you could just keep searching and finding and discovering new things so i knew at that point that if i wasn't going to keep pursuing art i would somehow make a career in the digital space. I didn't know what, I didn't certainly didn't know it was going to definitely be advertising. I didn't know if it was going to be marketing. I just knew that the medium was calling me and that somewhere within that digital space, I wanted to be engaged. And now it's like, of course, it's like the air we breathe. At that point, you know, people were like, what is this digital thing? You know, they weren't, you know, if you decided to focus on digital, you were really, you know, the 10%. And that was like that for a long time, you know? So the job that I took the summer, I took a summer internship when I was in business school. Um, none of all the, the, the like the dot-com companies had, you know, were going out of business. And so Credit Suisse Asset Management was looking for somebody to help them with their websites and understand like who was visiting their web pages and, um, you know, where were they re coming from and how long Thing. And so I spent my summer creating this massive book of like every web page on Credit Suisse Asset Management and like, you know, detailed web metrics, you know, of like how many visitors, how long did they stay, um, email campaign analysis, like anything that we could track and have data around. And at the end of the summer, even though we were, you know, digital, I remember we printed out this big book for my manager and uh, with all, all, of, all of that information, that was like the beginning of, of web metrics then. And, um, you know, it was fine. I, I was happy to stay involved. You know, I was learning. Um, when I graduated from business school, it was still not really a, a good time. This is 2002. Um, and Credit Suisse invited me back. So, I, you know, I took, a, I took the role. I didn't stay very long. It was probably less than a year um, because, you know, culturally, I'm, I'm not sure it was the right fit for me. Um, you know, being in uh, in financial banking, you know, I mean, even from artist to banker straight away is a bit of a jump, if you ask yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I worked my way back into a a firm um, called Merkley um, and Partners. Uh, it's uh, Omnicom um, a company. Um, so I'm pretty sure unless I'm blanking. Yes, run. And um, I got a job as like a digital strategist. And um, I went on to be a digital strategist for the next like, I don't know, if, you know, I was at Merkley for two years, then I went to Ogilvy for six years, and then huge and Avast. And I basically um, did strategy as it related to digital. That was everything from in the early days, websites, then it turned into social media and then mobile and um, all different ways in which the internet and digital, you know, from gaming, anything, you know, that was, and for so long, like I said, it was really the minority. I mean, especially in agencies, when I went to Ogilvy, you know, the digital strategy group was like this little group and most people were brand strategists, you know, they were doing the big commercials and, um, and, you know, now it's, I don't even know if they make a difference, but at that point in time, there was a really, there's a delineation. And even now, like there's a whole group of people. I look back in my past, like I know that came from like the razor fishes and the, the RGAs and a certain group of like digital shops, um, organic versus, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a different track, a different track. So anyhow, I, I did that for quite a while and, um, 
yeah, I found that in the world of advertising, there are a lot of creative people, you know, creatives who wanted to like have a job and make money and art directors. And um, I think being around that was, was good for me, you know, so. No, no, no. I think, I think you're a little bit of a like genius in kind of like staying ahead of the curve and kind of like knowing, like focusing on the things that really end up exploding and taking over the world. So I should, I think we should all pay like really close attention to like whatever you're working on and just be like, okay, that, that's kind of like where things are headed. But, um, and you're also very humble. I mean, you weren't just a digital strategist. You actually, I would say work like the VP and you were kind of group director, I think at Ogilvy. So you were someone who was kind of like in charge of much of the probably digital strategy that was going on. And as you said, and I think we also said in your introduction, you really saw kind of like the evolution of kind of like how advertising and, and kind of like the, the the aspect of that evolved over the years, as you, like you said, like from websites to social media to gaming and, and kind of like that whole arena. Are there any core truths of digital strategy that you feel have remained the same like over the last few years? Yeah, I mean... I think the, there's always the the um, inclination to get bedazzled and excited by the new technology, whatever software uh, of any generation, whether it was Flash back in the day or now it's like, you know, game engines. Um, and it's always you have to remind yourself, like, never technology just for technology's sake. Like, everything has to go back to a human and an insight. And there's always, you know, no matter what you do. So um, that has been that has been true. Like the best experiences, the best ideas are because you're solving a problem for somebody or you're helping. Right. Or you're and then there's a variety of ways you're communicating something new, you're educating, you're rewarding. But it, it has to, to, to sell something. Um, and, you know, we, we see a lot of the time, you know, we get sort of. Um, entrapped by the excitement of like, I'm seeing, you see that now, right? As, as the world is trying to figure out this new metaverse space, there's a lot of buzz and a lot of things being created. I'd argue, you know, a lot of that isn't necessarily a value. People are trying to figure out what people value and don't value. You need to do that along the way. But if you focus on what people want, they care for, what they need, then that's how you make sure you're using the technology in, in the right way. Oh, very well said. And if I could kind of like describe like your story and how you move around, is you always kind of like seem to go with your gut, you follow your heart, and you're you're like a risk taker in that sense. I think career wise, but also in in kind of like your own journey, I think you you try out many different things. And one of the things I think when we were chatting earlier is that while you were at Ogilvy, you you went abroad for a while and you lived in France for a while which is something that I personally think you have so much like like courage and I'm so amazed that you actually like took the time to do that because I know so many people who are like, well, I've, I'm already rising in the corporate career and like I don't want to kind of like 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 put a pause on that and, and like they put a pause on things that their heart wants to do, things that they want to try out just because they feel like they're already making it somewhere and they don't want to kind of like rock the boat. But you did something absolutely amazing. I think you you've managed to still like like grow in your career, but at the same time, like took a bet on on trying something new, I think for a while, even relocating to France for a period of time. Tell us a little bit about like that experience in your life, why you decided to do it and and how kind of like you you found the ability to do it in a way. Yeah. Um, so I'd been in Ogilvy, I think five years, and I at that point, you know, was doing digital strategy, maybe eight or nine. It seemed at that point I was doing it forever. Um, and uh, I was restless and I thought you know, and I was still single, not married, no kids. And uh, I was a bit of a Francophile then. I really, really liked, you know, everything French. So I wanted to either, you know, do something bold, like, you know, move to France or try to go and be an artist again, you know? And so I just made the decision, you know, that I, that, that I wanted to do it. I, I, you know, the generation before me, like my parents, you know, had the same job their whole lives. They didn't do things like this. I, I guess now I, I never thought of myself as like a risk taker. Um, I guess it was a little risky, but but the reality is like my generation, your generation, like that's encouraged. That's, you know, people, you, you know, 
you have so many opportunities. You know, I knew other people who were leaving their jobs and doing other things. I mean, it was the time of the internet. So like, you know, the, everybody, people were moving to the Silicon Valley. People were like launching their own, like any possible idea was a new company at that point. So there was a lot of momentum in the air. I don't remember feeling like it was that, that bold, but I did, you know, I, I decided I was going to go and I didn't even know if, if at that time Ogilvy was going to support me. Um, and luckily, you know, um, Brian Featherstone Ha, who was the, the uh, CEO then at Vogue One, he, he did, he supported me. And so I was able to, you know, I swapped my uh, apartment before I knew, you know, if it was, if, if the company was going to back me. And, I, and then I had a job at Ogilvy France, uh, Paris for about six months. And, you know, where I worked, we had IBM was a big campaign we worked on then. And, um, and, um, and Remy Contro, I remember we went down to see their, their, um, the, the liquor where they, they had their liquor in, in France. That was very exciting <laughs> for me at that time. So, you know, it was, um, I don't, it just felt like I, you know, something you just need to do. Right. Um, I, it never felt really that, that crazy. I just, like I said, I think if you have the luxury of being able to keep challenging yourself, you know, um, I know that's somewhat of a privilege to, to do that, that, you know, to be able to just say, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to do that. Not everybody um, has that, has that ability, but, you know, um, you know, my, my ambitions and aspirations like materially aren't that high. So I, I felt like I could, you know, I was living in a rent stabilized apartment. Um, you know, I, I never wanted to conquer the financial world. Um, it was more about conquering the, uh, the intellectual and creative and artistic worlds, you know, I think you said it very beautifully, and I think that you probably touched many of the hearts of the viewers, and they're in tears now, and they're all planning their next trip to wherever their heart has been bugging them to go. So, no, very, very well said. And tell us a bit about kind of like coming back and, and kind of like figuring out what your next steps were. So, I think you spent like some time um, at um, another amazing um, uh, agency, I think Havas Media Group, and then yeah. you moved on to your role at Accenture Interactive, where you are now. What was yeah. the journey like on the way back? And how did you end up moving to one of the most complicated to learn about fields that people crack their heads over and still like struggle to understand to this day? Like, no, like you, you've you already been a very complex person, like just from the way that you see things. I see, okay, she's really smart. She, she works in strategy. I'm sure she's really like, like got her, her brains together or something. But how was the kind of like the journey towards like literally being in a very, I would say, like, I wouldn't say scary, but I'd say very volatile feel in a way where new things are happening and new innovation is, is like literally at the forefront of technology. Tell us how you went from France to there. In a way. <laughs> well, in, in a quick minute. Um, yeah, when I, I, you know, I didn't wind up moving to France. It was, but basically it was really difficult to get a visa. There's lots of reasons why it didn't work out. Um, uh, and I, you know, I went we won't get into depth. I went to try to do some art for a little bit. I took it. Eventually, I wound up at Havas. And the reason I took the role at Havas, it was a global role. And even though I wasn't going to live in, in France, I was like, this is great. This is a world where I get to travel around the world um, and interact with different cultures. Um, and it was also media. And so at that point, you know, if you work in advertising, there was always been a clear distinction between creative media and like media like the people who buy the commercials versus create the commercials that you know and so it was you know at this point facebook google all of these media companies were so uh, intrinsically involved in the digital space you couldn't just have a website you had to have like a page on facebook or youtube that i thought it would be interesting to learn about the media side not just the creative um the creative side so i joined havas uh, i was there for about five years I, I uh, my I reported to the, the the CEO who was in Puto, uh, right outside of Paris, and you know it was brilliant. I spent those five years, you know, going to um, South America, to to APAC, all through Europe, um, basically, you know, working on how digital, different formats of digital, can be used to you know launch new products. I mean, I won't say it was saving the world by any means. I mean, we're talking about launching, you know, cars or chocolate or, um, 
we also had this meaningful brand survey, which was all about, which we, they still do to this day, you know, how do brands move from this product driven to purpose driven, right? So the brands, like you see more and more brands focusing on purpose when they're trying to, um, you know, basically uh, um, sell you, sell you goods, but that that's a much more important. And, and while I was at Havas too, I, also found myself, you know, digging into other, you know, areas of digital, like like robotics and wearables. I mean, the the Fitbit and these watches were coming out, and so there was all this myriad of different tech that was happening. Um, and so once again, I sort of shifted after about five days there, and I was like, hmm, this innovation space of digital seems really interesting. It's the next frontier of like where there's going to be interactivity and and experiences, and I just happened to go to like an early on uh, Oculus, Facebook Oculus uh, um, conference and try a, a, you know, a headset. This is back in like, I don't know, 2014, 15, I can't remember. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And I you know, had the same sense I had with like when I first started going online, like virtual reality was like, mm, I'm, like incredible what you could do with it. And so needless to say, um, I refocused and I was like, this is where the, where the future is headed. I didn't I spend the first, I, I moved to, you know, Accenture um, to, to build a, to an XR studio. And for years, we didn't have a name for the space. We were like, it's extended reality, virtual reality, augmented reality. And then, you know, I was, you know, uh, Facebook decides to rebrand themselves, to call themselves Meta and a few other key things happen. And suddenly now the whole space has a name and it's the metaverse. So, um, yeah, that's where, I, that's where I am now. Okay. Very, very cool. Was it like, okay. Again, I feel like, like you're someone who, who, since you listen to your heart, like very closely, you end up like kind of like being at the right industry at the right time and all that. But one of the things that I like, um, that I personally learned from watching some of your videos and, and some of the things that you did, you did was kind of like how right now we're in this space where, um, personal use. And I think, uh, commercial use for a lot of like VR and all of that is um, at a similar level, but in the future of logically commercial use is going to overtake like personal use and gaming and all of that by leaps and bounds. And we're going to live in this world where I would say VR and AR and everything in the metaverse is as needed and as important as probably the internet that we're using to watch, like, like our audience is using to watch us listen to this conversation. But many times it's like, when like I think prior to when something exciting is like gonna happen or like prior when like something innovative kicks off, um, there's a lot of people who end up getting left behind because they just don't see that this is the next big, like big thing or they just don't see that oh this is like something something interesting is happening here. And I've been fortunately or unfortunately in, like in a space right now where I'm trying to learn about this and but of course the focus of some other people maybe aren't so aligned to that and then all. For you, who has always been one step ahead of the curve, how do you deal with kind of like prioritizing your time and energy and knowing that something is is going to take off, but maybe not having the as much support or as much belief like in it as from others who are not you at that point of time? Yeah, well, I feel like, feel like you had two questions there, or maybe even more. I mean, one of, them, <laughs> one of them is about like what we use call the digital divide, right? Like as the, inter yeah. as the internet and, and Wi-Fi access has grown um, increasing over the years in smartphone usage. I mean, there used to be a whole discussion about who has smartphones and who doesn't. I mean, I think that is um, been a bit more balanced. I wouldn't say it's balanced, but you know, there's been a big effort to get everybody, you know, digitally connected, right? That's, that's, but for a long time that, that was the focus. And now you see this, now shift not just from digital focus, but right to connect it to this next wave, which is, you know, things like cryptocurrencies, you know, NFTs. And, you know, it's what's scary about this wave is that the last wave I feel was exploratory. People were like, no one knew, you know, there was the, the, the rise of the dot com in 2000 and then it busted. And so p some people like myself stayed in the space because we just enjoyed it. Some people got out of it and went back to like traditional media um, because nobody really knew what was going to happen. You know, um, now because 
the the gains that were made during that time period and the gains that we've seen being made even when mobile took off and we were like why would you use a mobile phone and then you know uber was like a huge success the gains with all of these people are like wow this space is like you know i hate to say it but it's like what a money what a money opportunity you know and that to me is 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 kind of scary because you see people jumping in and buying crypto and buying bitcoin and buying virtual real estate not because they're excited about what you can do with it or how you can use it or but because they think they're going to make money right and um and when it becomes all dictated by money then it becomes less about the experience and so the people who have and don't have so that concerns me a lot that so much of the um because we've had such success with technology in the past that the expectation now is like, you know, I'm just going to throw in money, 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 money. Um, what was the other question you asked me? I can't remember now. Like how, like on one side, it's kind of like for the extra believers, how do you kind of like, like hope with that digital divide, but on the other side, it's also for the non-believers who are probably not like so focused on it. What do you do like to get, more interest in kind of like the area to kind of like convince consumers or clients that this is something that could potentially help their business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, what would I, back in the day, we'd always do research, you know, research, like, look, 50% of the population is online, 75% of the, you know, a lot of it is research because there's so much hype and, and this is where I actually believe in that da data. Um, I read an article last week, someone posted that was like, you know, everybody's talking about this like virtual reality, um, real estate boom, you know, this idea of buying real estate. And the reality is it's like 1% or I don't even, maybe not even 1%, you know, of the population is actually buying virtual real estate. And so I'm, you have to be cognizant, like even with virtual reality a few years ago, you know, it was like less than 10% of people have ever tried VR. So it's about convincing clients, but, you know, I would never oversell or hype something. And so I am patient. I know these things will take time. What I think is interesting is I got into this space a few years ago, knowing it was like less than 10% of people using it and having a horizon or time frame of the next 10, 20, the rest of my life. I was like, this is a space I'm going to stay into for the rest of my life. Right. I'm excited. It's exciting. And, um, you know, who knows what's going to happen with virtual augmented and, and this will be my career until I you know, don't have a career anymore. And then suddenly um, people just jump, have jumped in it recently and like set this expectation that um, everybody's using it <laughs> and, and making people who aren't using it feel like they're, they're, they're left behind and they're not. And the reality is we're not there yet at all. It's still like plenty of friends who don't know about this space. Should you be interested? Perhaps yes, but it's, it's gradually happening over time, right? I think it's always good to be educated for people who don't like technology. Like with everything in life, you'd want to be educated so you can make an informed decision where you can influence the decisions that are being made, even if you don't like, you know, the space, even if you're, you know, not interested in technology, it's still important. So I, you know, I send my parents articles all the time about like, this is what NFTs are. <laughs> this, is, this is why you should, you know, just be aware, right? Um, but so it's a mixed message there. I would say like, it's good to be aware, but you don't necessarily need to jump into it right now because we're still, you know, developing the tools. We're still not like headsets are still kind of heavy, you know, maybe <laughs> people comes out with their glasses, which they say in a year or so, um, we'll have that moment of the iPhone where, you know, it becomes democratized and everybody starts using it. So. All right. All right. Um, very, very, very nuanced thoughts. And I think that, Talking to you is very helpful to kind of like ground us among all of the hype and all of kind of like what people are like, like just getting, as you said, excited over kind of like the what 1% of the population are doing and, and kind of like just latching on to that. And maybe not looking at kind of like the whole big picture as you very, very like, like, I don't know, put it in such a simple yet, yet kind of like understandable way. So thank you so much for like kind of like breaking that whole thing down. What is one thing that you wish more people knew about this space. So one thing that if you could ensure that everyone out there knew one thing about this whole metaverse space, what would it be? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I was going to say, 
before you ask that, that I, I hope I wasn't sounding too like negative or too, I guess no. I'm a bit of a realist, <laughs> even though no, I'm in it. reality. Um, so, because ultimately I find the space fascinating and I find, you know, what's possible uh, when you, you know, move into different dimensions and there's no gravity and there's no borders. And, you know, uh, I, I find that, that really, really exciting. Um, I think that you'd be surprised probably now I feel like I'm contradicting myself, but in as much as the technology is being developed, the technology is also available everywhere. Like when you use your phone and you use a filter and you know, the filter changes your face and puts, you know, whether ears on you or you changes your lipstick or that is a form of, you know, augmented reality. And that's one of the elements of the metaverse, which is like the, um, the mixing of the digital and physical worlds. So there are, there are, I think people on one hand um, are not maybe as cognizant of how many of these, you know, like just like a lot of people don't realize artificial intelligence is in so many of the things we use every day, right? You'd be like, that's, uses artificial intelligence, wow. Um, but at the same token, you know, it doesn't mean that tomorrow we're all gonna be living, you know, inside of a computer. So <laughs> I think there's some incredibly, incredibly amazing things you could do to like, teaching, education, learning, um, you know, that this, this technology is going to enable us to do. So, I mean, I'm a big proponent of, of the space, um, but, you know, like with everything, we have to keep our eyes very open because of data and ethics and, you know, with all, what is the quote? With all great advances or brilliant inventions comes great evil or harm or there's some quote that says you know every advancement has the potential for the negative so you have to think mm -hmm. about that and not to quote any great inventor but to quote spider-man with great power comes great responsibility with it, right? it. <laughs> yeah that was probably what i was trying to get i couldn't remember yeah. spider-man he just gets yeah. it but anyway but no very well said you you are again someone who's absolutely brilliant you have like always they've like, been at the forefront of things you are someone who i personally am very inspired by just listening to your story because it's not a traditionally conventional path of uh, that i think most penn students would set out to think that this is like what we we'd want to do but you are always kind of like at the right place at the right time and you seem to be having the time of your life learning new things so what would your advice be for all of I don't know the students right now who are living in this world where they can see kind of like on the horizon something some big changes is coming they're living through a period of change and they are equally as confused about their current reality and their future and what they're going to do next anything that yeah. could hopefully give us a little bit of clarity <laughs> well I mean hearing you say these great things about my career it's you know in the moment you don't feel that even now I'm like you know I have I have yet to accomplish what I need to accomplish so you know, life is all about perspective. And, and so I never at one moment during my life thought, wow, I'm really, you know, changing things up or doing things different. I, I, just, I tried to do what I enjoyed um, and, you know, make some money doing it. You know, I didn't, there's the philosophy of, you know, you, you basically have a job to make money. I don't subscribe to that philosophy, right? I recognize the, you know, the the importance of making money, but I always tried to take jobs where I, um, you know, enjoyed what I did. And you know, I think we were talking about is like, how do you even know what you're good at or what you like, right? And that's not apparent, you know. And I, I remember when I first started my job in advertising, you know, I, like I said, I wound up in advertising because I just liked the digital space and it seemed creative in advertising. But even in advertising, I remember that my first boss said to me, well, are you an account person or are you a strategist? And frankly, I didn't know. I was like, really, now I know the difference. Like account person, you're like client facing, you're dealing with the clients, you know, strategist, you're coming up with the ideas. And some people like the, you know, interaction. And, and he, I was like, uh, he's like, of course you're a strategist. So <laughs> luckily he told me, I didn't need to figure that out. Um, and then retrospect, I'm like, of course I am. So sometimes it's having people tell you like, hey, you're good at this. You listen to them and you follow what people say you're good at, you know? And sometimes it's, and I've used that ever since then, like strategy is the, the core of what I, I stick to um, wherever, whatever I do, right? So um, 
And every time I discover I like something, I try to add it to my, like, oh, I like technology. I'm going to add it, you know, and, and I'm going to push something off of myself that I, that I don't think I'm good at because the worst, not the worst, but I think the challenge is, is you're, you're developing as everybody gets confused. Like I like everything and I want to do everything and, or I'd like nothing and I don't want to do anything. Like, how do you figure out which direction you go in? So it's a process that I think of constantly chiseling and changing and not being afraid to do that, you know? No, no, well said, and we should write a thank you note to your first boss for pointing that out because <laughs> he obviously like like got that right in like his first try. But, like, yeah. no, it, that's very very nice to hear, and I think it gives me at least a little bit more confidence, and hopefully our audience a little bit more confidence. And thank you so much for actually spending your time with us and and being here to share these experiences with us. I. Again, as I said, I think I said it too many times, but I really enjoyed today's interview and I hope that you enjoyed talking to us as much as we did listening to your experiences. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Thanks a lot. I mean, I would just say if any, for anyone listening, like, do not be afraid. <laughs> That's the fear is what, you know, for, fear of like doing things differently, trying new things. That's the only way you make progress. So for yourself, for the world. So that's what I would recommend. So, Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with that sadly i guess our interview for today is drawn to a close um we had an amazing guest speaker and we had an amazing audience thank you guys for listening and if you guys have any questions drop it in the comments i'll see what we can do about them and if you guys want to talk about anything else that you may be wanting to explore let us know as well and with that this has been changing reality and we hope you have a great week and see you again next thursday bye you're listening to Changing Reality. Changing Reality, where we bend reality all across the world. Only on WQHS.